Well, I, I think we can probably, are you ready to roll, Lisa? Should Yeah. Ready, ready as you're ever going to be? Ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Rick Sterling, and I'm the uh, on the board of the Arma Saskatchewan chapter. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Lisa for coming, uh, Lisa, Lisa Palinchuk, I'll be introducing her today, but thank her for, for uh, doing our presentation today. Uh, this is um, a combination effort from the Western Canadian chapters of ARMA to put on uh, four presentations over RIM month. So I'm really excited about that, uh, to have all four presentations coming, coming along uh, during RIM, uh, ARMA RIM month. So uh, I, I'm here to introduce Lisa. It's my pleasure to do that today. Uh, Lisa is the uh, uh, manager of corporate compliance at the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. And she is responsible for corporate governance, policy and compliance matters. As assistant privacy officer, she is responsible for privacy and anti-spam matters, as well as freedom of information notifications and responses. Lisa also supervises and supports the librarian and records coordinator and oversees the records management program. You're a busy person, Lisa. I can tell right, right away. <laughs> Indeed. She supports the board of governors and meetings as members as assistant secretary and is responsible for the administration of the nominating committee. She's also responsible, just another hat on top, for a corporate compliance in relation to trademark registrations lobbyist registrations, contracts, and restrictions on third-party election advertising. Wow, Lisa, that's a big plate. <laughs> Indeed. So uh, Lisa is also the secretary of the, um, uh, the Armour Chapter, Calgary uh, Armour Chapter since uh, 2020, I believe, Lisa, is that correct? Correct. Yeah. And um, prior to that, prior to her current job, Lisa was the assistant board secretary and assistant to, to the uh, general counsel at her organization. She belongs to several organizations. ARMA, of course, is the most important one because we're doing ARMA today. She has a Bachelor of Education degree from the University of Saskatchewan, yay, and has a Master Access and Privacy Professional designation from Privacy and Access Council of Canada. She's a member of ARMA and a bunch of others. And we're happy, happy to have you here today, Lisa, to do your presentation. You know, sorry, go ahead. I'm I'm done. I'm I'm done. I'm going to uh, fade into the background now and turn off my camera and let you uh, do your presentation. All right. You, well, you can share your screen down at the bottom of the the share screen button, the little green button at the bottom of the screen there. Okay. And I'll just uh, say to everybody too that we'll we'll be I'll be using I'll be uh, monitoring the QA today for questions. Lisa, do you would you prefer to have questions at the end of your presentation? Would you prefer to get some of them on the way through? How would you like to do that? You know what, for, for me, it doesn't matter. Are you able to see my presentation here? I can't seem to. I can't as yet. Okay. Um, There's a share screen button at the bottom, a little green button at the bottom of the screen there, it says share screen. Okay. And it'll let you pick which, which screen you're going to share. Are you able to see my screen now? Uh, no. Just a second here. It might be behind something on my, uh, no, at the moment I can't, Lisa. Okay, let me try this another way here. I apologize. Oh, that's nothing to I apologize did have for. I IT here earlier. We've all been going through this for the last two years as a group. We're all used to this for sure. Are you getting uh, any message when you try to share a screen? No, I can contact my IT here. Um, okay, now I have a box here, but I can't find my presentation. How lovely. Um, let 
best laid plans. In any event, I'll start off with thanking you for that lovely introduction. And um, so I just have a little bit of disclaimer information that I'll start with that I don't have in my presentation in any event. And um, as I try and find my presentation here. Um, and okay, I can share my screen one. That will work for me as I open it up here. Um, this looks promising, Lisa. Good, good. There we go. Okay, now if I can just move. Um, as I was saying, I... Um, I'm born and raised from Saskatchewan. So are you all able to see my screen now? We certainly can. Excellent. Thank you for the patience. I truly appreciate it. Um, I was born and raised in Saskatchewan, but I now call Calgary and actually Airdrie home. And so it's a pleasure to be here to present to all of you. And thank you for the wonderful introduction. So the disclaimers that I have to give up front are that my degree is actually in education. And so I'm not qualified to give any legal advice. And everything that I tell you here today is just based on my 22 plus years of experience, having worked in um, law firms and corporate and associations in various legal and other capacities. And that includes the areas of records management and privacy, which we're here to discuss and go over today. So I'd also like to note that um, I do work at the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, but this is my own presentation and not, um, it's on my behalf of my experience and not on behalf of that of my employer. So this is the overview of what we're going to be reviewing today. It's, you know, crammed into about an hour. So it's going to be very high level. Some of these could be topics of an hour long webinar or even a full day course themselves. So today we're just going to be doing the basics. I want to review some of the privacy legislation that does exist. Um, so we have private sector privacy laws. I'm not going to go into detail on each of the pieces of legislation, but I would point out that as RIM professionals that you'll want to be aware that there is privacy legislation. You're going to need to know which privacy legislation your organization needs to respond to or is subject to. So PEPIDA is the federal legislation that applies to private sector organizations with respect to personal information that they're collecting, using, and disclosing in connection with their commercial activities. And then federally, we also have Canada's anti-spam law, which is also commonly known as CASEL, which was put into place um, to govern commercial, commercial electronic messages. And it was put in a place to ensure that our mailboxes are not filled with spam mail. However, if uh, your mailbox is anything like mine, since it was enacted, I've gotten more spam than ever. <laughs> And sorry, I'm happy to take questions throughout if they arise on anything or at the end, whatever suits. Um, we do have provincial legislation and the provinces that have chosen to adopt their own privacy legislation, that's okay, as long as their legislation covers what PEPIDA essentially covers. So your organization could be uh, subject to one of the provincial acts. I know CAP is subject to Alberta's PIPA um, privacy legislation. Um, and if you are subject to a provincial act, then PEPIDA does not apply to your organization, except for with respect to international and interprovincial transfers of um, information, personal information. So the health sector, of course, um, is one where we would see a lot of personal and information and have to have privacy at the forefront of our minds. Here are some uh, notes, and I'm happy to provide this presentation out to you all in, you know, soft form after. 
Um, but you just want to make sure that if you are working in the health sector, that you're aware that there are certain health privacy laws that you'll want to um, find out which ones your organization is subject to. We also have um, some other privacy legislation that isn't uh, that touches on privacy, both federally and provincial. Usually that's the access to information and freedom of information. Um, it's important as, as RIM professionals that you know which ones um, that you're subject to, they exist. So, you know, Alberta is where CAP is based. So we're subject to the Alberta Freedom of Information Act, but you you have one in Saskatchewan as well, that if you are working in Saskatchewan, your organization is most likely subject to that one. And then we have what we call the common law. Um, so this is in addition to laws that are passed through Parliament and the legislature. It's a body of law that's created when cases go to court and judges make written opinions um, in their judgments and those become case law. So you need to be aware of that anytime something related to personal information or privacy goes to court, it could be creating a new law. <clears throat> so that brings us to the definition of personal information, which is the root of um, privacy. What personal information is, is um, when you're able to identify um, an individual based on um, information that's provided to you. So at the root of privacy and RIM is personal information, and you do need to know what this is so that when you identify it and see it in your records, you can subsequently handle it appropriately. So there's a list here, and sorry, I'm not one to read my slides. I assume we're all able to read, and if you can't, I'm certainly happy to have a separate session with you to do so, and I can read it to you, but... Um, there are some pieces of information that are listed here in the personal information that in and of themselves might not be enough to identify a person. So if you just say, um, you know, there's a female who's 32, well, that could be any number of people. It hasn't identified an individual. However, if you start to add a name or a social insurance number, then you get a scope of who that person could be. Even if you say there's a brown haired female um, who is age 32 that is working at McDonald's, that even narrows the scope, but it still might not be enough to provide um, the information required to identify the individual. So I would say that equally as important as personal information would be confidential information, but um, the focus of this presentation is going to really be on personal information and privacy. However, many of the concepts that I'm going to review with you today can be applied as well to confidential information. So keep that in mind as well. So we have the CSA model um, for the Code of Protection of Personal Information. And there's 10 principles that they've come up with that govern personal information. These are the guidelines for how personal information should be handled appropriately. And um, they're applicable for any industry and um, for how you need to be handling the personal information your organization is dealing with. The privacy commissioners in Canada reference these principles throughout the materials on their websites, and they are really are the foundation for ensuring that there is privacy in our records and information um, management programs. And we're going to review each one of these just in a little bit more detail, time permitting. 
So we have the principle of accountability. Most organizations have a dedicated privacy officer, but some have what they call a chief compliance officer or some such other title that would be akin to a privacy officer. And that's the person that's responsible for ensuring the proper handling of personal information. In my organization, CAP, I'm the assistant privacy officer and our general counsel is the privacy officer. So your role as RIM professionals would be to know who is this person within your organization. And um, that's the person that you would approach if you see any mishandling of personal information within your records management programs or your records and information, or if you have any questions related to privacy or personal information. There may be other personnel within your organizations that will be involved, but the ultimate accountability lies with the privacy officer, whether or not it's human resources or IT, your privacy officer remains the primary resource for, um, for accountability. The next principle is um, identifying purposes. So it's important to know that you can't just collect personal information because you want to. You have to have a justifiable reason to collect it. Before you can even collect it, you must um, identify, okay, why do I need this? Why is it required? Um, and also, I'd like to point out that even just having a reason to collect it isn't enough. You have to be able to articulate to um, the public and the people you'd like to collect it from, why you need to collect the personal information. So if you can't do those two things, have a justified reason and articulate that, I would suggest that you do not collect personal information that you would like to have. Consent is a really important part of personal information and um, privacy and um, as records managers, you may play varying roles in the um, collection, use and disclosure of personal information, because consent has to be a choice that's being made by the individual that is providing the consent. So um, there are some exemptions to it, consent, but generally express consent is what's required. And express consent is when the individual directly confirms their consent, either in writing or verbally. Um, and then we have what's also called implied consent. And that is when someone is deemed to consent um, without actually giving consent. So they voluntarily maybe provide personal information to your organization. And it's reasonable for whatever purpose they provided it. So that's called implied consent. And if you have one of those two forms of consent, that's valid consent. Consent should really generally be expressed. I never like to rely on implied consent because it can only be really used in strictly defined circumstances. And it's really harder to defend if there is an issue. And it's called into question whether or not you have valid consent. So you should, if at all possible, get express consent. And that should be documented because if you're ever called into question, well, did you have consent of the individual to have this personal information within your records and information, you want to be able to prove that you either had the express consent or the implied consent. Um, and so as RIM professionals, it may be part of your role to set up the files that hold the records that um, document this consent, maybe to even document the consent yourself. It really depends on how involved you get into um, it based on your role. The next principle that we have is the principle of, I, oh, Limiting collection. So if you don't need it, don't get it. You know, you want to ensure that personal information is only collected when, as I mentioned, there's a reason to collect it. You're able to articulate that reason. And the personal information collection is limited to only what's necessary for that purpose. So for example, um, and I'll use payroll because most of us have payroll in our organizations, so can relate. You might be requiring um, 
the employee's first and last name and their social insurance number for your payroll records so that you can get them a paycheck. But at the same time, you may also on the same form ask for their ethnicity and their maybe sexual orientation. Those are personal information triggers and you don't need that information to process the payroll. So it's not mandatory that the employee provide you with that information. It doesn't suit your purpose. You don't need to know my ethnicity to process my paycheck. However, if you say, you know, we're collecting a bunch of information and we like to celebrate international days that are important to our employees and, um, you know, ethnic celebrations. And so you've given them a reason. It's not really, you know, for your payroll purposes, which would be the reason you're collecting your personal information. But they can choose to tell you that or not based on what you've given them for a reason. Um, and, and that would be then implied consent to collect that personal information. However, I would strongly caution you against collecting any unnecessary personal information. People can provide it freely, but if you don't need it, don't, don't collect it. It's just unnecessary. The other thing that you'll want to limit is the use and disclosure of that personal information. It must be limited. Um, you will need to have valid consent for how you plan to use the information and you obtain that at the time that you're collecting the information. Um, and the plan also includes how you are going to disclose it and to whom you're going to disclose it. So the personal information can, um, only use, be used for the purpose for which you've collected it or received it, and you can't use it for any other purposes. So your employee, going back to the example, has provided you with their name and social insurance number for payroll purposes. Well, you can't then use that to um, sign them up for some government benefit program. You have to have their permission to use that personal information for that other purpose before you go ahead and use it or disclose it. So important to keep in mind that you have to limit use and disclosure to those persons within your organization that have a need to know basis. Payroll or any other personal information should not be going outside of a need to know basis, given you know, the confidentiality that your employees or your clients and customers will be expecting of you when they provide that personal information. The principle that goes along with limiting use and disclosure is limiting retention. You must limit the retention of personal information that you have in your records and information. Um, it should only be retained for so long as it's necessary to fulfill the purpose that you collected it in for. Once you've collected it, you've used it, you've disclosed it how you said you were going to, how you articulated, you must then destroy it. So as RIM professionals, when you're designing your retention schedules and when you are looking at destroying your records on an annual basis, um, you will want to make sure that you're aware of where personal information is located in your records and that the a the privacy of that has to be maintained at all times, but B, um, it has to be taken into account in the destruction cycle of your records. Uh, once the purpose of it is being fulfilled, that personal information should be destroyed out from your records. There may be some legal reasons to keep some personal information in your records um, after it's served the purpose that you collected it in for. So take, for example, um, you know, employee files may need to be retained for seven years after, you know, cessation of employment for tax or other legal purposes. But normally get rid of it once you're done with it. That's your safest bet unless legally retention requires otherwise. My keyboard seems to have stopped working here.
Okay, so the next principle um, is accuracy. Under privacy legislation, individuals have the right to confirm the accuracy of their personal information that an organization has collected on them. So, um, and also how it's used and disclosed. So the collection use and disclosure, of course, would have been done with consent of the individual, but then they may contact you and say, you know, I just want to make sure what I gave to you is accurate. And you have a legal obligation under legislation to make sure that it is accurate. So personal information needs to be safeguarded. Um, it should only be accessible to those persons in your organization who have a need to know the information. So this can also, I'll mention, sometimes extend to third parties if you have a contract with a consultant or um, a third party contractor, but it must only be disclosed to third parties when you have an agreement in place that has confidentiality provisions and when you are disclosing the personal information that um, you confirm to the third party con contractor that it is personal information and it is subject to the confidentiality provisions that um, are in the agreement and prevent further disclosure of that personal information outside of that. So third parties are okay in certain circumstances, but you have to have the right contractual terms in place. It's important to safeguard the personal information um, you know, physical records such as employee files, payroll records, um, if they're being stored in unlocked cabinets, you're not adequately protecting the privacy of individuals and their personal information. Likewise, in your electronic records and information, if everybody in your organization is able to access all the files within your records and information system, you've probably got personal information in there that's not being adequately protected. Um, in your role, you might need to, you might be responsible for ensuring that we, your organization has the proper cabinetry that locks or, you know, um, is uh, maybe it's a room that locks and is not accessible. I think, you know, a lot of IT folks have a server room that's coded and you have to have the code to get in. Um, you might be responsible for ensuring that your records management program for electronic records is able to lock down access on certain records. I know that the CAP records management program, we have permissions we can provide and only certain people have access to everything in the system. Privacy and personal information should only be accessed on a need to know basis. So now that I've said lock it up tight and throw away the key, except give a copy to those who need to know, I'll talk about the principle of openness. <laughs> it actually isn't about the personal information itself. It's about policies and practices. You need to make sure that um, the public is aware of what your policies and practices are. And this brings us back to the principle of accountability. All these 10 principles in the CSA model are interrelated and connected to each other. One doesn't operate well without the other. Um, so you have to have your policies and practices in place. People should be aware of who is the person that they can contact about that. And you want to make sure that, you know, um, privacy is a part of all of your RIM policies and procedures you have in place. Like you want to have confidentiality of your records, I'm sure is part of your policy already, but, you know, privacy is a part of that. And a lot of organizations display their privacy policy right on their website, as well as they can list who their privacy officer or chief compliance officer is for contact so that you're open and transparent about it. As I mentioned previously, individuals, um, they have the right under privacy legislation to request accuracy of their information. They can also request access to their personal information that you have as an organization collected, used and disclosed. So there are actually timelines um, for when you have to provide the information. It's usually 30 to 45 days, depending on the piece of legislation you're subject to. 
but you can ask for extensions of the privacy commissioners if you know there's things in in the pieces of legislation I've looked at more recently like undue hardship or you know just too many records to go through 30 days is not reasonable enough for a five person you know organization in some cases but they do have the right to ask to go through their personal information and correct anything, as I mentioned, that may be in incorrect. And so as records managers, you might be called on by the privacy officer to help with collecting in those records. It really depends on your capacity. We actually had like five of these last year while I was working from home. So it was a really lovely week and a half of me going through a bunch of records, trying to determine you know, who had accessed them. And we have really good audit provisions on our um, systems. So I was able to do that, you know, relatively easily, but it was, you know, a lot of records to get through. And I'm the manager of corporate compliance. So, you know, but it could be part of your role as a record manager or a records assistant, depending on what the scope is of your duties. So, um, as records managers, your role might also be to determine who's had access to those records. So if you're talking about physical records, that could be a little bit harder. Now, I know, especially after the last two years, we're all moving away from paper as much as we can because working from home, you know, kind of caused that. But um, there are still physical records in the records and information management world. So you might want to implement things like access logs, particularly for information that's confidential or um, private or personal information to ensure that you can track who's had access to that information. Electronically, it's a little bit easier to put in those audits and controls, but it is important to have those within your records and information management programs so that when you do get an access request, you can accurately, quickly, and easily tell them, here's who's accessed your information that we're holding on file. And as I mentioned previously, um, individuals can challenge the compliance that your organization is doing with records and information management. If they don't feel that the personal information you have on record for them is proper or accurate, they can complain. Um, so then the principle of accuracy becomes important, but as you'll recall from that slide perhaps, um, you don't want to be continually updating information without a reason to do so, but you do still want to ensure accuracy. Um, you don't want to have to spend a bunch of time after the fact trying to identify incorrect or inaccurate records, but um, you know only update them when it is necessary to do so in the event of a you know complaint or somebody voluntarily provides you with updated personal information. You want to safeguard this information so that when they do um, challenge your compliance, you can say, actually, here's my audit records and here are the people that have accessed these records and no one else, you know, to the best of the organization's knowledge has accessed records. Um, so the next principle is reasonableness. Um, so as noted in the principle of identifying purposes, you have to have a reasonable purpose for collecting the information in the first place. It really all comes down to, you know, they don't want harebrained schemes and unreasonable people collecting in a bunch of very confidential information without a good reason in the first place. If there's not a reasonable purpose for you to collect the information, let's go back to the payroll, you know, you're collecting first and last name and social insurance number, maybe you need a home address to send the pay stub to, although it's all usually electronic, hopefully by now. Um, there really wasn't a reason to ask for ethnicity and sexual orientation, just don't even go there. It's not worth the headache that you could get your organization into. Um, so, um, it might not be your call as to what to collect and what not to collect, but you can 
question your privacy officer. I think most organizations have a speak up type policy in place now. So if you're questioning, you know, why are we collecting this? Why are we keeping this? That is your role as, as a RIM professional, you know, you're responsible for the records. And so ask the question and, you know, document your answers, of course. When privacy is concerned, the less you collect, the use and disclose, the better. Um, and I, I'll reiterate this because it's a very key point to this presentation about personal information and privacy. Only collect what you need for your reasonable purposes. Only use it in the way that it was collected um, for, and only disclose it to those who have a need to know basis. And you must destroy it once it's no longer useful for the purpose for which you collected it. So those are really key points for today. And I've again lost my ability to advance. Okay. So what does this mean for you as RIM professionals? Um, you need to be aware of Firstly, what is personal information? So hopefully we've covered that today. Um, and that it can be in your records and information. And it relates to your policies and your retention schedules. And you need to be aware it is its own, you know, special category of law that has a lot of different legislation and regulations around it. Particularly health is, you know, keep in mind a special area of privacy. You need to know who is your privacy officer so that you can approach that person um, and, and, you know, if you identify something that seems untoward about privacy, that person will be very hopefully, hopefully respectful of the fact that you're attuned to privacy. It means you care about something that's important to them. And each of you will have different roles within your organization, but um, regardless of your role, it's important that you ensure that personal information is safeguarded, the lock cabinets, the access, the audit features on your electronic records and your physical records, if you have any yet. And um, um, above all, Everything you do in your role as RIM professionals, it needs to be done with privacy in, in your mind. And so that brings us to um, privacy by design, which is um, a concept that was first developed by Dr. Anne Kavakian, the former Information and Privacy Commissioner for Ontario. So I'd say here, like privacy is not something that you as an employee are entitled to do in your organization. It's like an absolute prerequisite to everything that you do as a RIM professional. We don't have time to review these seven principles today, but I have provided a link here to the Ontario website where it goes into a little bit more detail about each one of these concepts. The most important thing to keep in mind is that um, every project or activity that you do, and not just yourselves, but anyone in your organization, it has to start with privacy in mind. It has to be worked with privacy in mind. And um, privacy considerations have to be given throughout the life cycle of the project and activity right up to destruction of the records. So it really is embedded within everything that you do. And this is, as I said, not only the RIM projects, it's every project in your organization should start with, okay, where, where could we have privacy issues or personal information? And it goes back again to the audits and controls that you'll want to have in place to um, ensure that the personal information records have not been compromised. So I've kind of reiterated throughout that you, you need to have policies and procedures. These are required by law. Um, you have to have them in place to ensure privacy is protected for individuals. You need to be transparent about what it is that your policies and practices are. And so that goes back to the links on the websites and the privacy officer contact records on contact pages. You have to tell them who's accountable for privacy in your organization. Um, 
And so the more open and transparent you are, the better, because trust is a really important thing with, you know, your employees, your clients, your customers, your members, whatever type of organization you're working for. And, you know, being transparent is great to build trust. And if you aren't, and trust is very easily compromised and very hard to earn back. So you will have risk management programs that will work in concert with your privacy management programs. So everything we've talked about here today so far, or I've talked, I should say, the privacy by design, ensuring records and information management takes into account privacy. That's all part of what we call a privacy management program. And that basically means how your organization handles privacy is your privacy management program. Um, and it all starts with privacy by design. You can identify risks that, you know, in your risk management program, risks that may have within your records, um, what the impact of those risks might be to an organization. So what would the impact be if you're storing personal information in unlocked cabinets and it gets stolen? What would the effect of that, you know, privacy breach be? Um, so for example, if you're setting up your records management system, or maybe making changes to the current system that you have, you'd start with privacy by design so that you can ensure that you're being proactive and preventive. Okay. I need to have some lock cabinets because we're going to have some personal information and I want to prevent a brief privacy is your default setting. And then so you start with the very strongest lock it up settings that you can have on all your records and then open them up only as it's necessary. Okay, so if there's no personal information, is there any harm to an individual through a privacy breach that everybody in the organization have access to record A? Probably not. There may be other reasons to lock record A down, but not personal information privacy reasons. But if you're having um, employee home address information because you had to ship electronics to them through the pandemic, you would not want that open to all employees because that would be a breach of privacy. And so that's a very nice segue into my next slide, which talks about privacy breaches. I'll shorten this so we can have time for questions. Um, just know that there are breach reporting obligations and um, you need to report if the likelihood of harm, if, sorry, if there was a likelihood of harm to the affected individuals of the breach. So if you have payroll information that gets stolen and it has social insurance numbers on it, well, that's an identity theft risk. So there's a likelihood of harm to affected individuals and you will have to report that to the appropriate privacy commissioner and you will have to ensure that you take steps to remedy that breach. And when I say you, the accountability, again, remember, it lies with the privacy officer. So they're the ones leading the fold, but you may need to be involved as the RIM professionals. So we can't all be experts in all fields or even multiple fields. And I certainly don't make that claim myself. I just am a person who has a very diverse background. I know a lot of things about a lot of stuff, but I don't absolutely do not come call myself an expert in anything. Um, I just have years of records and privacy experience. And so I hope that I've achieved my goal today, which was not to make you experts on privacy, but just to give you some highlights and make you aware of some of the things that you as RIM professionals need to be aware of. So after what I've given you today, and again, I'm happy to share my presentation out, um, you'll hopefully know what personal information is and be better able to identify it and where it resides within your records and information. And you'll be able to identify like risks of the personal information and mishandling of it when you see it. And also privacy breaches, you know, as RIM professionals, you know um, where your records are most um, confidential. So put privacy in that category as well. I would encourage you to um, 
approach each project that you start and encourage the others within your organizations to approach everything with the privacy by design in mind. Start with privacy, lock it all down. Um, and also look at the 10 principles for how to handle personal information and keep those in mind for everything that you do. There's nothing that crosses my desk, no contract, no, you know, election advertising thing, no lobbying thing where I don't think is this got some privacy aspect to it. And so each of the topics to cover today, they could really be their own webinar, you know, privacy by design or the 10 principles, but um, I'd encourage you to check out the websites for anything you want to know more about or feel free to reach out to me. I've gathered a lot of resources over, you know, the years on privacy, but the Privacy Commissioner websites are really, really helpful and useful. And I'd encourage you to, you know, utilize them, even if you aren't residing in Alberta, the Alberta Privacy Commissioner website will have information because, as you recall, <clears throat> they all have to be substantially similar to Pepita. And so um, you'll want to make sure that, you know, you do refer back always to the legislation that your organization is subject to, but there are a lot of great valuable resources on the other um, websites. So I would uh, be happy to take any questions now, if anybody has any. And I think- I That's guess great, it's Lisa. Sharing. Yeah. Maybe, okay. uh, Rick, you want to go ahead and read out some questions for Lisa to answer? Sure, sure. Happy to do that. Okay. So, Lisa, we have we have several questions here. I just want to. I'll just. Um, my screen just went a little crazy on me here. Oh. Is everybody else's screen look okay? Yeah, mine looks good. Yep. Okay. One of the questions, uh, Lisa, is uh, could, could Lisa touch on the difference between privacy and proprietary slash confidential information? Okay, so privacy really deals with personal information and proprietary information would be confidential. So proprietary would be something that is developed um, you know, personal information, I'm not developing it necessarily, maybe I am by if I dyed my hair or something that could be personal information, but proprietary is more of an intellectual property concept. And um, that's if information is developed. So you're creating something with within your organization, say you've developed a new robot that would be proprietary information, which would therefore then be confidential, something you don't want the public to know. So personal information isn't necessarily stuff the public isn't going to not know. Uh, it normally is confidential. Um, personal information is confidential information. It's, you know, the two confidential information can go much further than personal information, though. It can be um, you know, the fact that you have a business relationship with an, another organization, most employment con or most uh, third party contracts have confidentiality provisions in them. It could be the fact that your members are disclosing to you information that they don't want the public to know. So while private information is confidential, confidential information goes that much further and proprietary information is that that which is developed and likely also subject to confidentiality. Another question. Thank you, Lisa. That's, mm -hmm. that's great. Another question is uh, what are, uh, what are an organization's responsibilities to report a PI breach? So <clears throat> pardon me, as mentioned, it's, it comes down to, the harm that it might cause the individual who was breached. So as I choke on my water, if, um, to give an example, if you share information with a third party, that's personal information, but that third party, you know, I actually wrote an example down here, that third party, um, let me go here. 
Um, so if your organization shares personal information with an, another organization and you don't have valid consent to share that information, it would be a privacy breach. Whether or not you have to report that breach to your commissioner really comes down to um, what you should report all breaches to the commissioner, but whether or not you need to give notice that the breach has occurred to the individuals that are affected by the breach comes down to that concept of harm. And so what would the harm be to me if you shared my name and um, age to another organization? Well, probably not a lot. I mean, they might think, oh gosh, she's old or something, but it really wouldn't harm me other than my feelings might be hurt a little bit. Um, but say, for example, your payroll records get stolen and there's social insurance numbers on there and you don't know who stole them. Well, there is a real, you know, risk that there's going to be harm caused to the individuals whose records were in those payroll records or personal information. My identity could be stolen. Um, my home address could be on those records. So it's it's just really a matter of what was the breach itself? So here's another question, uh, Lisa, for you. Mm -hmm. so let me, uh, my screen's still giving me trouble here. So bear with me for just a second. No worries. Uh, will, the, will the PowerPoint presentation be available to us, uh, Lisa, after the fact? Yeah, absolutely. I'm more than happy to share my, my PowerPoint presentation. That's why I don't read my slides. I figure most of you are very, you know, articulate folks and can read that part yourselves. I prefer to talk about what's on there. That's great. And and I, I had, didn't uh, share with everybody that we are uh, uh, recording the uh, presentation today. Lisa, are you okay with that? I am fine with that. Yes. And we'll, we'll put it up for, uh, we'll have it available for people after the fact. Now, the, the question that the other question was, what if you work for an NGO and, uh, and advocates on behalf of vulnerable communities? So you want to hire people who are intimately aware of the challenges and, discrimi and discrimination that the community faces. How does the NGO square that circle? So I'm not really sure that I understand the question, but I can speak a little bit about privacy um, from the CAP perspective, because we do have our Canada's Energy Citizens Program where privacy is paramount and the NGOs would also have their advocacy groups. So before we can collect in the name and email address of um, somebody who we'd like to be in our advocacy group, we need their consent. So on our on our um, CEC webpage or on the N NGOs advocacy webpage, you need to have a sign up form that has the proper consent. And you'll also want to ensure that that's CASEL compliant. So the person is voluntarily providing you with their personal information. And your disclaimer on that sign up form will say that um, by entering your information in here, you are agreeing that we will be able to do tasks A, B, and C. So that might be contact you with respect to um, issues of importance to our advocacy group, send you emails with respect to issues um, relating to the advocacy, and do a multiple multitude of any other things, send you information about um, issues of importance relating to the advocacy group. Um, and so you're obtaining the proper consent for CASEL through that process, but you're also getting implied consent to have that personal information being held in some type of a database. I don't know whether you use, you know, any, you could use Dynamics or Nation Builder, whatever it is. Um, and that's where, you know, those third party contracts come into place. You have to have the confidentiality provisions because you may be using a third party to store that personal information. And then you can only do the activities with that personal information that you've said that you're going to do. So if you haven't said that you're going to um, provide their information to a third party who is also um, a 
you know, has a like mind to whatever advocacy your end goal organization is doing, you cannot do that. And if you do, it's a privacy breach. And then you have to look at, okay, what is, I have to report this to the commissioner. What's the risk of harm that I gave this to the third party? So it is really a cycle. I mean, I, I could talk about that one for hours because I have extensive knowledge of how our program works, but I'm not sure I understood the question, but hopefully I gave enough information to give somewhat of an answer. Yeah, that, that maybe I can clear that up a little bit, Lisa. The, the follow on to that is meaning uh, hiring people people from the vulnerable community and adding personal questions and asking personal questions of them while you're hiring them? Um, so that really you want to make sure that you are not overstepping. Like you don't want to ask, um, are you married? Do you have kids? Do you plan to have a family? Those are questions that are taboo for vulnerable or not vulnerable communities. Um, you would want to stick to your basic questions. We don't even like in the privacy world, we don't even recommend like doing the Facebook. I know a lot of organizations do it, but a lot don't because of the privacy considerations, doing the Facebook trolling of potential candidates, you know, because it puts up biases. You, you can't ask those personal questions in the interviews when you're hiring. If the information is available publicly to you, you know, an open Facebook page or LinkedIn, they have splattered all over there that they've recently been divorced and, you know, drink too much or something, then you, you know that that's what that person is. But that's personal information and you do with it what you will. How you obtain it is really what's key. You can't ask those questions in HR interviews, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on what side you're on. Um, so, so don't like it, I, I know it makes maybe hiring difficult, but it's, it's just not advisable. Well, I want to thank, uh, thank Lisa. We're, we're up to our, up to the top of the hour here. And, and uh, I, I certainly uh, would, would let everybody know that we're going to have the presentation and Lisa's uh, PowerPoint on uh, somewhere where you can get a hold of it. And Lisa, thank you so much today. It was a wonderful presentation. Really oh, enjoyed. Really thanks. enjoyed it. Thank you so much for, you know, having me. I really enjoyed giving the presentation and my contact information is, is on their screen or was, I guess I can still see it, but it'll be in the presentation when that's circulated. And, you know, I'm more than happy to go a little bit more in depth on some of the concepts. It was really high level, um, you know, but uh, anytime you have a question, please feel free to reach out and I can, you know, send you off to some resources to try and help out. And thank Thanks, you again for having me. Much appreciated. And of course, uh, we have another presentation next next week at the sa very same time and, uh, and the, the next two weeks as well to uh, cover off our RIM month. Uh, next next week's presentation is Andrew Guider, and I, I've known Andrew for a long time, and I'm looking forward to hearing his presentation as well next week. And uh, please uh, come back and, and share the next three presentations during our Armor Rim Month. Thanks, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for attending. Hope to see you all in person at some time in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs>